This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. In modern Western liberal society, there's a smorgasbord of options for leading a life. One can even choose to be a fundamentalist and advocate illiberalism. The variety of options may tempt us into moral relativism, the view that one moral system is just as valid as any other. But Susan Neiman, an American now based in Berlin, as head of the Einstein Forum, thinks liberals in Western society need to stand firm in support of a set of progressive beliefs drawing on forgotten or ignored or misunderstood strands from the Enlightenment. Susan Neiman, welcome to Philosophy Bites. It's a pleasure to be here. The topic we're going to look at today is morality in the 21st century. Look, there are all these different moralities available to us, like they're laid out before us. We could be a utilitarian, we could be a Kantian, we could be subjectivist, relativist. Is it just a matter of individual taste? Is in the arts? You know, there are so many different kinds of art. You know, the interesting thing is that if one looks at it in the abstract, many people think there's a huge amount of disagreement. If you actually get people to talk about individual cases, it turns out that there's a great deal more moral agreement than one thinks. Um, I've often experienced in every single conversation where people say, oh, it's all up for grabs and it's, you know, just a matter of preference, you say, okay, so is it just my preference that I don't believe babies should be burned to the god deity Baal. I mean, sometimes if you get a very young, very persistent young man, usually, he'll say, well, you know, in those days it was just fine. But as a matter of fact, you can usually lead people through specific examples of moral progress. If you just look at not only the last couple of thousand years, but even the past 200 years, where there's a huge amount of agreement. I've been studying a lot about the American Civil War recently and the abolition of slavery. It's not simply the case that the Southerners said, we just simply like owning human beings. There were two opposing sets of moral claims. People may have believed that it was perfectly all right to own human beings, but we don't believe that anymore, and that's one example we can come up with many. And yet there are slaves today, sadly. In many countries there are slaves in the same sense that were slaves in the 19th century in in North America. You know, if I pointed out that there were people who still believed that the earth was flat, it wouldn't invalidate Copernicus. The fact that we don't live up to all of our moral ideals doesn't mean they're not valid and doesn't even mean that you can get quite a lot of consensus on what they are. So I'm really interested in this idea of consensus because, for me, one of the big features of the 21st century has been this clash between fundamentalist religion and more liberal secular values. Absolutely. First of all, I think when you look at that, you have to realize that this is a very large problem. People tend to talk about Islamism. In fact, it's as big a problem in Arkansas as it is in Afghanistan. We in the West, who are not fundamentalist, need to look at what we've done wrong such that fundamentalism has been on the rise. This is not to excuse the Taliban or Sarah Palin or any of those people whatsoever, but it is to say that we of progressive Western values need to look at what we've done wrong so as to provoke this kind of reaction. And I think we've done a lot wrong. The rampant consumerist culture that suggests that he who dies with the most toys wins, suggests that that's the purpose of life, that a kind of atomized race to global capitalism is going to solve all of our problems, is understandably going to provide a kind of backlash. And I think a lot of the move towards fundamentalism in different cultures is an attempt to say, no, actually, I I want my life to mean something more than that. I want to be guided by certain ideals of the way the world should be. If we don't recognize that impulse, and if we continue to see fundamentalists either as, say, Dawkins, Hitchens, they're just simply irrational idiots. If we look at them that way, 
or if we look at them as cowardly, weak-kneed people who can't understand how to live in the modern world and they're sort of grasping at old straws, we are lost because the criticism of consumers' contemporary culture is in many ways a valid one. What you're suggesting sounds like constraining people in their freedom to select the life that's best for them. You know, this is not a very new truth that riches don't buy you happiness. And I'm not talking about constraining. We are surrounded in the world by advertising which suggests that our lives are going to be sexier, brighter, happier if only we buy one more thing. It's very hard to shake that. I'm not arguing for total asceticism. I like pretty things as much as the next person. I'm talking about getting a perspective on what makes life worth living. So where are we going to find these values that are important to live by? The place to look is the Enlightenment. And to defend the Enlightenment is simply to defend the modern world with its possibilities for self-criticism and transformation. And I think there are only three alternatives. You can go for pre-modern nostalgia. Things were all better in some golden age before. Well, they weren't better for many people. Or you can go into kind of post-modern cynicism and give up the idea that anything has value at all. Between those, I go for defending modernity, but also saying, well, what's crucial about the Enlightenment is a self-criticism which allows us to go further. Now, standardly, the Enlightenment has been seen as valuing fairness, Tolerance, I'm not even sure I like tolerance at all. You tolerate bad smells. You tolerate things that you can't change and have to live with. I think it's much more important to look at robust values of the Enlightenment. I've identified four. The first is the value of happiness. Now, this is often confused with consumerism. To understand why happiness was so important and why the claim ensconced in the American Declaration of Independence that everyone has a right to equal right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, you need to think about what things were like in pre-modernity. Happiness was either something in a golden age that we lost or something that you might get to in heaven if you did the right sorts of things. But the idea that everyone had an equal right to the pursuit of happiness was completely revolutionary. If the natural world presents contingencies, illness, earthquakes, or injustice, you would simply say, well, stuff happens. That's the way the world is. The idea that we have a right to happiness means that we also have a right to intervene, to intervene against social injustice if it looks like there are illnesses that could be cured and that aren't simply the will of providence to punish people who were bad in their previous lives. I mean, when you say that everyone has an equal right to happiness, you also change a bit the notion of happiness itself, because it turns out then not to simply mean getting stuff. If you don't view the goal of life as something beyond the world that we live in, it means that happiness is not an end state passive consumption. It means that happiness is an active pursuit of being in the world, of creating something in the world, and indeed of giving something back to the world. There have been an enormous number of empirical studies lately, and all of them suggest that simply buying things, whether it's, you know, million-dollar watches or collections of op art, it's a very small part of people's happiness. Once you've got a basic standard of living that allows you not to worry about yourself and your family, love, friendship, community, and in particular, a sense that your life is devoted to something that means something. And all of the studies show that. Okay, that was the first value, happiness. What are the other three? Second value of the Enlightenment or of modernity is the value of reason, which has been absurdly caricatured in just about every 
description of the Enlightenment, starting with the counter-Enlightenment, you know, in Edmund Burke in uh, the 1790s. It's a very old claim that if the Enlightenment is in favor of reason, it can't deal with emotion. It has to mean a, a very cold, instrumental, mathematical view of the world so that you see reason as opposed to passion. This is completely wrong. As a matter of fact, the Enlightenment paid as much attention to passion as they did to reason. Moreover, they never thought that reason was unlimited. They were very clear that reason had limits. They didn't see the goal as some kind of monster machine. What they opposed reason to was superstition and blind authority. The idea that centers of power could simply say, well, I said so, and that's a reason. I mean, a king or a priest or whatever, or I intuit, God told me to invade Iraq. I mean, George W. Bush said that. He truly believed it, okay? Now, an Enlightenment answer to that would be, well, maybe he did, but if we're dealing in the public sphere, what you discuss with your God is your business, but if we're doing public, political, moral actions, we need to be able to justify them and argue about them in a transparent way that every moderately educated person can understand. So you've got happiness, reason, what comes next? Reverence, and this is the one that surprises an awful lot of people because they tend to think of the Enlightenment as being utterly anti-religion. Of course, the Enlightenment was against almost every form of established religion, and they were against the way in which religion is politicized and used as an instrument of oppression. They were also against the way in which religion tends to take the place of thinking for oneself and using one's own reason. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Bible, particularly if you look at the Hebrew Bible, the demand to think for yourself and to think ethically for yourself is right there at the beginning of Genesis. The Enlightenment wanted to do away with established religion, but not with reverence. And if you look at all of the science that was going on in the 17th and 18th centuries, the belief was that the more you understood nature and creation, the more you felt in awe of and grateful to a creator. Now, for me, it's not important how one envisions a creator or whether one envisions a creator at all. That we have a sense, number one, of gratitude for the world, and number two, a realization that Wherever the world came from, it wasn't us that made it. I think those are two extremely important moral emotions that might be able to unite both secular and religious people. I'm not clear how reverence is going to change our moral behaviour. You can, you can have reverence for the beauty of a bomb exploding. There's something quite amazing if you watch Apocalypse Now, the firework display, as it were, of the bomb. Look, the sublime always had an element of terror in it, and uh, they talked about this in the 18th century. I mean, they weren't talking about bombs. They were talking about wild storms, for example. And there's no doubt, again, this is a biblical notion. If you look at the book of Job, which I think is one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written, creation is not the Cotswolds. And creation has some elements of real terror in it. I like the Cotswolds. This is nothing against the Cotswolds. The point is simply creation contains not just simple and easy beauty. Where I think reverence makes a moral difference is that it, it gives us a sense of both humility and gratitude. And I think if you feel that about the world and you realize that, well, you're a part of this world that was created, of course, you have to feel it towards other human beings as well. So we've had happiness, reason, and reverence. What's the fourth of your categories? Hope. And hope is something very different from optimism. It's often claimed that the Enlightenment believed in necessary universal progress and the world was just marching on forward and that human beings are wonderful, natural, benevolent beings, but we know better. As a matter of fact, no century knew more and was more concerned with the existence of evil than the Enlightenment. There are passages in Kant that are almost misanthropic. So the Enlightenment did not believe in 
optimism. They made fun of that. This is what Voltaire is doing in Candide. But they did think there was hope. They did think that by using these other values that I've talked about, human beings could actually improve the world on the basis of these ideals. And if you think about how much we have done so, it's really quite extraordinary. I, I mentioned the abolition of slavery. Another crucial example is the question of torture. 300 years ago, it was considered absolutely standard for people to be drawn and quartered in the center of any of the capitals of European civilization and to sell tickets. People would have taken their children as a matter of amusement. And interestingly enough, it took Voltaire and Diderot, this is not Cheney and Rumsfeld, it took Voltaire and Diderot quite some time to come around to the idea that torture per se should be abolished. Now, you might say, um, well, but look, we've got torture back, and what does this show? Well, it shows exactly what the Enlightenment said. Progress is a matter of human action. It's not necessary, and we can also regress if particular human beings, call them, in my country, Taney, Rumsfeld, Bush, individual human beings make a difference. Progress isn't necessary. You certainly cannot say that a world in which people are, thank God, prosecuted for authorizing waterboarding is the same in which ladies could take their children to watch someone being drawn and quartered. But it also shows that vigilance is absolutely necessary, that we can't take any of these things for granted, and that the progress that earlier ages made by using Enlightenment ideals need to be used to deal with things that the Enlightenment didn't think of. I mean, for example, sexism was not really an issue until the very end of the 18th century. If I were going to judge any of these people on the basis of what they said about women, I would have to say, forget it, you know. But as a matter of fact, using the same ideals, we have made enormous progress in my own lifetime. So are you saying somebody who looked at the world today and ended up a pessimist is just wrong? You know, pessimism is an attitude that may look brave. And I think this is really quite interesting because there's certain people who propose it with a rather macho stance. You know, I'm tough enough to see the facts. But it's actually a very cowardly way of dealing with the world because if you only think that things can get worse, of course, then there's nothing to do but lie back in your armchair and shake your head at it. Whereas if you think there's some chance that human action could make the world just slightly better or even keep it from getting worse, well, you're actually responsible then for doing some small bit of something in your own lifetime. So the idea that pessimism is somehow brave or honest is, I think, a, a sleight of hand. Susan Neiman, thank you very much. Pleasure. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk Thank you.